Uh, our guest on the program is Eric Zimney, Vice President of, used to be at least anyway, I should probably get your updated title here. Uh, Eric, has there been a change with your move, sir? Yeah, hey Rob, hey John, yeah, my, I'm the Assistant General Manager at our property here out in uh, Columbus, Ohio, so no longer in West Virginia, but uh, we'll always have uh, some roots and great memories back there. Well, we enjoyed your time while you were here. Easy. No, I appreciate it. I loved it. Love, always love coming on the show. Talk Derby, talk Preakness, talk Belmont with you guys. Great time of year for sports. Not just horse racing, but, you know, hockey, basketball. You got a lot going on. First and foremost, you mentioned hockey and uh, the Penguins, of course, not being in the playoffs this year. They reacted to that by firing Ron Hextall, Brian Burke, and somebody else whose name I don't remember, uh, which was long overdue. Um, Hextall may be the worst general manager in the history of hockey, and I'm not saying that just because the Penguins missed the playoffs, but the Grandland deal alone, after he found a sucker to take Kasperi Kapanen, <laughs> was enough at that point along the way where he should have just been, they should have taken his key and padlocked the door so he couldn't get in. So here's how bad it really is. When you say it's a long time coming, the guy was only GM for two years, right? He was GM for five because of how bad he ran it into the ground. But imagine giving up a second-round pick for Grandland in a draft like this. It's just crazy. Oh, my goodness. I have to say the hockey playoffs have been extraordinary this year. Not that they're not most years. And I haven't caught every game, but the ones I've caught have been just amazing. And we had so many game sevens. And so much good hockey. It's just been a pleasure to watch. And with the Penguins not in it, kind of stress-free on my end, too. Exactly. It's going to add a couple years to my life not having to go through it again (laughs) this year. But it's, uh, you know, it reminds me of the 80s almost with all the goals being scored right now. I think uh, six of the eight teams in game one of the second round scored four goals. So not not great goaltending. Good offensive hockey if you like it, though. Yeah, great point about comparing it to the 80s. And there's so much young talent in the NHL. Uh, now, too, you're seeing some of the generational icons like Crosby and Ovechkin uh, start to kind of age out a little bit. Not that they're still not productive. They are, but they're clearly not the center of the league's advertising campaigns any longer. As the, some of these young players coming up have established themselves now as the stars of the NHL. No, no, no. It's, it, it is Connor McDavid's league right now. And uh, just watching him play, I mean, the speed the guy plays with, it's... It's like he's from a different galaxy. I mean, the way he goes from zero to sixty in like two strides—it's it's wild. He just scored a hundred goals in the eighties. Oh my God! Yeah, I, I mean, I imagine a guy like that. I mean, imagine Edmonton with all the, you know, the, the power plays they would have gotten in the eighties too. It's, uh, I mean, they score now and they score in a tighter checking game, but. You know, Edmonton did it right back in the 80s, but if they had some of these guys, man, um, he would have scored. Yeah, he had Gretzky scored 192. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, you could see David scoring 100 easily. The 149th running of the Kentucky Derby is this weekend, and uh, we've got a pretty big field here. I see 20 horses in the post positions, one through 20 here. Eric, are they all still healthy enough to run? As of now, it's going to be a full field of 20, and even if they're even if one of the, the top 20 scratched, uh, there's three horses on what's called the also eligible list who will be ready to take their place. So I would anticipate it being a, a full gate of all 20 horses. I have three that I outlined as the favorites from the odds that I looked up here. And the odds on favorite, uh, it, F-O-R-T, does it pronounce it Forte or Fort? It's Forte. Um, he'll be the favorite. He was the best, best two-year-old uh, in the U.S. last year. He also has won his only two starts this year. Uh, but this is about as evenly matched as a derby field as I've ever seen. So, uh, you know, he's going to be the favorite, deservingly so. Wouldn't shock me if he won, but at 3-1, at to 7-2, to two, something that he's probably going to be for a horse who looks like he might have been developing a little earlier than the rest of his peer group, uh, I'll probably look elsewhere. Okay, so Angel of Empire goes off at 8-1, to one, and Tap It Trice is 5-1. to one. Those are rounding out the top three favorites. Do you like either one of those two? I, I do like Angel of Empire. I thought his race, the last race he ran, which is down at Oakland Park in Arkansas, uh, was really good, really impressive visually. Uh, got a, a decent speed figure, not as fast as some of the other horses in the race. But he looks like he's one getting better uh, at the right time. And that's kind of what you look for in this race. It's not necessarily the horse with the best resume coming in. Um, you know, it's not really about production in the past. It's about projecting forward. It's kind of like the NFL draft, right, where you're, you're trying to take traits and um, kind of try to project how someone or some, in this case, a horse is going to be at the next level in this set of circumstances. And to me, Angel of Empire looks like a horse who's getting better at the right time, and he's definitely going to be on the top of some of my tickets. Who else outside of that top three are you thinking you can win money on in this race? 
So I, there's a couple horses I like, and, and again, it's so evenly matched. I feel like you almost have to take a horse who's who's a decent price in here because there's not much that separates one through ten in this race. So there's a horse named Skinner. He's number nine. He's probably going to be about twenty to one. Um, for my money, he's probably the best horse, or as, as far as the horse is coming from California, the one with the best chance on Saturday. Um, he's a he's a late late closer, so you won't see him in the early part of the race. You'll probably see him later in the race. Um, passing some horses at the end, and, and hopefully he gets up, but he's going to be a, a decent long shot. And there's another horse named Derma Sodagade, who he is, uh, he's from Japan. The Japanese have been, you know, desperately trying to win this race for several years now, and this is probably the best horse they're bringing over. He's, uh, the U.S. is going to be the fourth country he's run in in the last uh, six months. Uh, he's, he's a world traveler, but he's very, very talented. He's very, very fast. And if he runs the race he ran, uh, like he ran in his last start, which was in Dubai, uh, he's going to be the winner. And he's probably going to be in the 12 to 1 range. So uh, some value out there if you can you can nail the right one. And your long shot, because the Derby last year, of course, was won by an extreme long shot. Yeah, extreme long shot's right. I mean, you know, Skinner is going to be a good price. He'll be 20 to 1. I don't know if you're going to see another... Rich strike eighty to one, like we saw last year. I mean, that was a uh, you know that's kind of a once in a generation kind of deal. But there's some horses who could hit the board who are going to be in that forty fifty to one range. I think there's a horse named Hit Show who's, who drew the rail. He drew the one. Uh, rough trip his last start. That was Hit Show, by the way. <laughs> yeah, Hit yeah. Show. Hit yeah. Show. Oh, okay, that's um, not what I heard. He's, uh, <laughs> he's tough. He he he's very talented. He's probably going to be forty or fifty to one. Hit Show. Hit show. H-I-T-S-H-O-W. Just, <laughs> H-I-T. Just in Correct. case anybody was listening too quickly on that one, it is hit show. Uh, very nice. And, and what is your uh, trifecta? I will go, boy, um, let's go Angel of Empire on top of Skinner and then uh, Dermasota Gade in third. Those are probably the three I'll focus on most. Uh, but, again, hit show. Again, for the audience, hit show. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think he can hit the board. There's a horse named Disarm. It's going to be 50 to 1 who can hit the board. Um, there's going to be a bunch of horses who I'll kind of put in, in third and fourth and, and just kind of hope the, uh, hope the lottery balls uh, pop up on my number. Hey, Eric, this is John. I got a question. We always talk about the horse. and the, yeah. How big a role does the jockey have in – the horse's performance is is the jockey letting the horse perform to its to its highest level or is the jockey actually m- manipulating the, the horse's abilities no the, the jockey plays a huge role i mean horses different horses are going to respond to different jockeys uh you know, different jockeys have different styles too um just like horses do and you know this is uh this is a, a big field there's 20 horses you don't Almost you, you never. This is really be the only time you're going to run in that kind of a situation where you have that many other horses in the race. So having a rider who has experience in that kind of environment is huge. Uh, it's why you see kind of the same core group of riders popping up in this thing over and over again. Uh, but the rider plays a huge role. The rider can make the difference. The rider is the one who's going to navigate the horse around the track and hopefully not steer him into any trouble because. Like I said, with 20 horses, you can get in trouble very quickly. There could be horses, you know, stopping in front of you, and you got to kind of make a detour, and that can cost you a race. So uh, the rider plays a, plays a big part, as does the trainer. And is, has the jockey, the rider, been with this horse through multiple races, or is this a matchup for this particular race? Yeah, you'll, you'll see all different, you know, all different. There's some riders who have ridden, um, you know, the horse for their entire career. Uh, you know, the horse we talked about, Forte, will be the favorite, a rider named Irad Ortiz. He's been on the horse for every one of his seven career starts. And then you'll have a bunch of other horses who, you know, be matched up with their rider for the first time. Uh, I mean, there's a famous story of the Breeders' Cup Classic, which is uh, one of the richest races in the world. And I, it the uh, second, I think, richest race in America, 1993, a horse named Arcane come from, came from France. The rider, Jerry Bailey, who won the race with him, is 100 plus to one. So the first time he ever laid eyes on the horse was when he got on him right before the race. Um, so, you know, you get all different things. These guys will work the horses in the morning sometimes, and sometimes they're, they're hopping aboard late. Um, but, you know, it can work out either way. So this morning there was news, not to go negative on these things, but there was news from Churchill Downs of uh, several uh, dead horses. Was there not? 
Are you familiar with this? I'll be uh, to be frank. I mean, I I haven't read it. I I saw the headline. I didn't read it, so I I don't know if there was a cause or anything identified. Uh, I I don't know the circumstances around it. Yeah, I always wonder because there have been uh, stories of of animal abuse here in in Charlestown, not necessarily associated with the the casino and racetrack, but in in this area. And I've always wondered if if there's not kind of a, a drumbeat that comes up as horse racing season really kicks in from. Uh, the people who who are not fans of of the sport. I just I don't know if this is a systemic abuse kind of issue. If if they're cherry pick stories, there's not really a question in there. I don't think, but kind of an editorial. Yes. All right. So hey, I want to ask you about Lord Miles, the Wood winner, uh, won the Wood Memorial at fifty nine to one odds, Eric, and it has some royalty in its blood. It's the it's the son. Uh, Lord Miles is the son of Curlin, the Preakness winner from sixteen years ago, I believe it is. Any hope for Lord Miles? Not much. Um, no, not much. I mean, he, he was, like you said, almost 60 to 1 when he won the Wood Memorial, and he got a perfect trip that day. Um, you know, he, he really hasn't shown much outside of that race since he, it's his only win other than his maiden win, which came in November last year. I, I would need, you know, 150 to 1 to use this horse. I, I, I think he's um, as close to um, as a throw at as he'll get in here. Is there a West Virginia connection to the Derby this year in any way that you're aware of? Uh, anywhere that I'm aware of. I'm not sure that there is a West Virginia connection with a, with a horse. You certainly have some of the jockeys in here. I've ridden at, at Charlestown before. You've had uh, a lot of these trainers run horses at, at Charlestown and, and down here before. Uh, no, no, no West Virginia bred actually. Uh, the dam of one of the horses, who is it? The dam of... I, I forget who it is. Two Phils, the horse. Uh, Mia Tori, who's the, the mom of Two Phils, who is another long shot who actually has a little bit of a chance. She actually ran in, in the Charlestown Oak several years back. So, oh, cool. Uh, some connections, yeah. But uh, you know, no, no one bred in West Virginia, unfortunately. What is Bob Baffert's current state in horse racing, Eric? So he, yeah, he is currently... Um, Banned by Churchill Downs by the racetrack there, so he is he does not have a horse in the Derby on Saturday. So it'll be the second straight year that'll be the case. Uh, I think that ban from Churchill was two years. I believe it ends sometime. It's at sometime this year, so you'll you'll see him almost certainly in the Derby next year. Uh, I believe he's going to run a horse, or he's planning to run a horse or two in the Preakness. Uh, and he's also, I don't know if he's allowed in Naira at the New York tracks anymore. So um, those are, are slowly, uh, you know, fading away a little bit. You're going to see him, you know, more present in these Triple Crown races going forward. But he's primarily in California right now. Is Todd Pletcher the big name in trainers in the absence of, of Baffert? Or is there another name that rises to the top? No, I mean, Pletcher is, I, I think, the one that, you know, he certainly has uh, one, of, one of the largest stables right now. He, he's had a lot of success. He's in the Hall of Fame. You know, he's probably the marquee name as a trainer. You've got some other ones who are up and coming. I mean, Chad Brown's a guy who doesn't have a horse in the Derby, but he's been around for a while. Brad Cox, he's got a few horses in the Derby. Um, and he actually, he, Brad Cox was the winner of the Derby when uh, Medina Spirit got disqualified a couple of years ago. Um, and so he's got a couple big shots, including Angel of Empire in here. But, yeah, Pletcher's probably the biggest name. All right. Uh, there aren't as many uh, fascinating names to these horses this year that are uh, out there. Uh, but there are a couple, like Ray's Kane. Uh, I saw 15 to 1 odds for Ray's Kane on that one there. That's pretty cool. Sun Thunder, is a th- I saw 30 to 1 on that one. And uh, the other one I looked at that was pretty cool, I think you mentioned already, uh, two fills, uh, which I kind of like as an interesting name as well. Any idea how some of these names came about? No, well, Philip Sagan is one of the owners of two fills, so I'm assuming that that had something to do with it. But, uh, you know, you look at the, the, the parents of the horse, and that's usually where they'll, um, you know, draw the name out of, like the sire of Race Kane was Violence, uh, was the name of the horse. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm sure there, there's a connection there. Um, but, you know, hey, look, horse like Tappet Trice, or you, you pay $1.3 million for the horse, you're going to name him what you want to name him. So, yes, you uh, are. You know, you, you, that's your uh, your prerogative at that point. There's some expensive horses in this race, too. So, um, yeah, you, they, they come from a variety of sources, the names. How uh, are, you, are you going to the Derby in person this year? I will be. It'll be, uh, believe it or not, number 20. 
uh, for me, Derby number 20 for me. So I couldn't pass that uh, pass that up living here in Ohio. About a three-hour drive. I'll go down on Saturday morning and uh, hope for some good weather. Yeah, any idea what the weather is they're calling for on uh, on Derby Day? Yeah, last time I looked, it was about 75 and mostly sunny. So oh, that's, nice. um, that's about as good as you can hope for. And uh, I have a feeling that people will imbibe either way, regardless of whether it's <laughs> raining or not there. But, um, yeah, it, it looks like it's going to be okay. My sister-in-law went to the Derby, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, whatever the day, it rained like crazy the entire day. Uh, tough experience when you're in the infield like that and it's raining as much as it was. It, it gets a little muddy. It's, uh, with 170,000 people in a confined area and rain, it's not the best combination. Yeah. Are you in the infield or are you in the stands? I'll be in the, sta- I'll be in the stands. Um, you, the infield, I'm a, I'm a bit uh, – it's, it's – that's a bit of my younger years. That's in the uh, rearview mirror, um, the, the infield party. So uh, I'll be in the stands watching, and uh, I, I just love the experience of getting to watch the horses. I mean, the, the sporting element, element of it for me is, is a big deal. As you know, I'm just a huge, huge horse racing guy. So um, getting to watch the horses from the stands, that's, that's a big part of the day for me. Is this a one-race day, or they have multiple races? No, they have the Derby is actually going to be the twelfth race on the card, so okay. they'll get started very early. You know, when I say very early, probably I think it's ten, ten thirty, something like that. And you know, they'll space them out an hour between races. Uh, but there's a bunch of great, great races that that go on there, and it all leads up to the Derby at you know around seven o'clock. Um, you know, such so that's part of the day that makes it so great, just the anticipation of everything leading up to this. Um, you know, kind of crescendo that people are waiting six, seven, eight hours for. It's uh, it's pretty neat. It adds to the juice. Um, you know, and then uh, then it's over. and We move on to Baltimore. Are you a mint julep kind of guy? I I like the mint julep. I know you know some people say it's a little too sweet for them. I like them. Um, I would be lying if I said I drink them any day other than the first Saturday in May during the year. <laughs> but uh, but I like them. They're 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 good. They're tasty. And um, you know, there's certainly a few of those that'll be sold on Saturday. And what's the Preakness situation uh, this year, Eric? That's it's what three weeks after the Derby. Uh, two weeks after the Derby, it's always two weeks to the Preakness, and then three to the Belmont after that. I got it. Uh, yeah, Preakness still uh, still at Pimlico, still in in Baltimore, and there've been some talks about what they're going to do with the property there at Pimlico. Uh, certainly not the most modern venue, but. Um, you know, the Preakness is a fun one to go to. I, I don't know if there's going to be. There's probably there's almost certainly not going to be a Triple Crown winner this year. There's no one that stands out as that caliber of horse. But the Preakness is always a good time. Just just different from the Derby in terms of the, uh, you know, the pageantry. We'll call it. That was my next question for you too. By the way, is is there a Triple Crown quality horse in this field? If there isn't, who's the closest to it? You know, all it's a good question. I, I just don't think that there is. I mean, tri- the Triple Crown winners historically have been. The cream of the crop, you just you know, horses that shouldn't win the Triple Crown and just happen to be the best three-year-old this time of year, they they still generally don't win. It's it's truly the historical horses that do it. I don't see that being the case here with any of these. Like a horse might get good at you know, very good at the right time here and surprise us, but I, I doubt it. I guess it would be Forte just because he seems like he's got the most class to his resume, and you know maybe he goes forward. But again, I, I, it is an extreme long shot that you're going to see a triple crown this year. How rare is it now that a single horse even runs in all three of these, Eric? It's pretty. It's very rare. I mean, you know, back in the day, horses would run every. You know, you'd see them run a week apart, um, two weeks apart. Uh, you know, like it's nothing. I think there was one. I forget who it was. One of the triple crowners, if I'm not mistaken, ran between the, the Derby and the Preakness. Um, you don't see that anymore, right? Horses' races are spaced out more and more. So, I mean, last year, Rick Strike didn't even run in the Preakness, right? He won the Derby, skipped the Preakness. Um, and you're seeing that more and more, uh, that two weeks and then another three to the Belmont. That's just too much for young horses in a, in a short period of time these days. So you don't see many horses competing in all three legs. Seems like horses have kind of gone the way of the starting pitcher in Major League Baseball in terms, yeah, in terms of how they've scaled them back. Analogy. Yeah, it's a good analogy. Um, I mean, you know, you talk about back in the day again in baseball. I mean, right now an innings eater throws 180 innings um, in a season, right? And, and, and you know, before you, you, you know, you'd want to see 200, 250 out of someone like that. And you, you just you don't see them going deep into the game. It's evolved. And racing's evolved, too. You know, there's a lot of money out there in purses. You can kind of pick your spots a little bit better. Um, not run as much and, and still do okay. So, it's yeah, it's a good analogy. All right, to close, Eric, uh, who's winning the race? I will go with Angel of Empire, uh, but 
you can throw a dart at this and be you know, one of eight or nine horses, I think could probably win. Angel of Empire, a little bit of Skinner, a little bit of Dermasota God, but Angel of Empire will be my key. Hey, great to talk with you again, Eric. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it.